Welcome back. The number to call, 8223 0000, if uh, you want to chat. Uh, and what we're going to talk about for the next uh, 20 minutes or so is um, uh, the, the something very close to my heart. As, as uh, regular listeners will know, I worked on a very, very wonderful uh, South Australian uh, produced a television show for quite some years called Postcards, of course. So there ain't, no, ain't much uh, part of South Australia that I haven't been to, uh, and I'm very, uh, I'm very honoured to have been in that uh, position. And um, that's what we're going to talk about today, nature-based tourism. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a huge uh, slice of the market which, with enormous potential and we're going to have a look at uh, how we're heading into that uh, part of the market and we've got with us the Chief Executive of the Department of Environment, Water and Natural Resources our good guest uh, Sandy Pitcher, welcome back Thank you. You were in a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. You still haven't shorted that title yet uh, on your <laughs> oh, business no, I'm card. I'm working on that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've also got uh, the South Australian Tourism Industry Commission General Manager, Sean De Bruin. How are you, Sean? Yeah, good, thanks. Good to see you. Industry Council. Just Industry, Industry Council, us, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Uh, and uh, tourism operator uh, from uh, Kangaroo Island, a company called Exceptional Kangaroo Island, and a very apt title, I've got to say. Craig Wickham, how are you? Thank you. Pleased to meet you. Um, and uh, we'll get on to Kangaroo Island specifically in a moment because uh, everyone will know my two favourites of this wonderful state of ours are the Flinders Rangers and Kangaroo Island. They are truly unique and a wonderful part of the part of the place. Firstly, Sandy, though, let's let's talk about uh, the nature-based tourism. What is it? Well, and it is funny you say, what is it? Because mm. I've, I've had a few friends who say, well, what is that? And I say, well, you know, it's putting nature at the centre of your tourist experience. And they say, but that's just tourism to me and I think for a lot of us it is but it is actually turning people's minds to the way that you can enjoy South Australia and all of those amazing natural um, assets that we have across our state and actually thinking about the holiday being there but probably the reason we're talking about nature-based tourism particularly is that for people visiting Australia from overseas um, it's the point of difference that probably makes us unique Mm. and certainly we think there's nature like nowhere else here in South Australia and so it's what's different in South Australia about nature tourism that might make someone come here and spend some quality time. And a good example of that, uh, I think, is uh, the Flinders Ranges and go beyond the Flinders up to, you know, Arkarula. Yeah. They're like chalk and cheese, but they're the same in the same family, aren't they? They're, they're the same historical aspect of what South Australia is all about as far as that landscape is concerned. Absolutely. But I always describe, you know, we'll paint a pound and that part of the Flinders as, as uh, you know, ragged old granny. But you go up to the to, to, to north um, and what have we got? We've got cranky old grandpa. It's, yeah. Because it's right. about 300 year, 100 million years older or something, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. And I think it is getting people that, that first bit of interest, whatever brings them in. And sometimes it's people thinking about our food and wine and then they Mm. think oh it's from such an amazing environment and that leads them to think about our environment and for some people it's having an interest whether it be will peanut pound or something and then learning the story and unraveling those great stories that we have whether it be the idiacran fossils or whether it be Mm. being able to look at just amazing sunsets and landscapes and seeing the way the vegetation changes and camping under the stars i mean there's almost no limit and for me some of the real power is getting to talk to the local aboriginal people Mm in each area and hearing the stories of the landscape and the way that some of the names or the way that the the Aboriginal people in an area have really um, lived and breathed that land their whole generation and their lives and it just brings a different character to the people's experience. Mm. And again, just talking about Wilpena Pound, I mean the wonderful Adnamutta creation story of, of the snakes. Wilpena Pound was formed by snakes. Yeah. And uh, I, you know, how many people don't know that? That's right. And I was lucky enough to be up at the Pound last week. We had a big focus with a whole group, a lot of Aboriginal people talking about managing parks with with the environment. And um, you just seeing Will Peanut Pound from the air, you think that's amazing. But how did the Aboriginal people at the time know the shape and the landscape? It, it just demonstrates that there are so many ways mm. um, that we experience the landscape exactly. and the Aboriginal people. Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. Sean, uh, from the uh, your your uh, uh, from the South Australian Industry uh, Association Tourism Industry Association, um, one of the big dilemmas, isn't it, uh, for you guys, is we've got the international tourism market, which is growing and growing and growing fantastically. But does it worry you how many people, for example, here in South Australia, here in Adelaide, have never been a to the Flinders Ranges and have never been to the uh, Kangaroo Island? 
Yeah, it does actually. It worries me as a local that mm. you know a lot of my friends and family need to get out and have a look at our amazing state. And I was actually only talking to someone last week who's lived here for many years, and and they've been up in Flinders Ranges last week and for the first time, for the first time. <clears throat> and they were talking about how amazing it was, and I said, "Yeah, like yeah. You know, I've been there." quite a lot myself and so but you, you do got to find you've got to find reasons to go out and enjoy your own backyard because we're all busy we've all got lots going on in our lives and so uh, taking the time out to actually go and visit other parts of the state is such a rewarding thing to do and encourage everyone to do it as much mm. as they can and i think a lot of uh, the problem revolves around or perhaps might revolve around the fact that people have the wrong impression of just how far away these places are and how difficult they are to get to it's sealed the road is sealed all the way into Wilpena Pound. Mm, exactly a lot of people right. think you've got to have a heavy-duty four-wheel drive to get there. Mm. Yeah, it's it's funny, isn't it? Because I was um, a, another story in that sort of way. Was I was um, a few years ago, I was talking to a family member, and and she had been to the Arctic to go see the polar bears. And I said, mm. "But have you been to Air Peninsula to see the sea lions? Mm. You need to go over to Air Peninsula and see the sea lions." Um, and so I think we do make that mistake that we're prepared to travel all over the world to do all sorts of things sometimes for our holiday experiences. But we have so many amazing natural experiences here in South Australia. Australia, it is in your backyard. You only need to travel quite locally to see experiences that people from other parts of the world are coming to see. Mm. Port Lincoln, for example, you know, the national parks and so forth over there, the history, the, the nature, it's all there and, you know, on, on our doorstep. Mm. And a lot of us haven't been there. All right, well, um, that's the local sector of the market. What about the international tourists? Um, growing big time, lots of people coming in from China. They're the biggest spender uh, and the figures are increasing. What are they looking for? The Chinese are a fascinating market, aren't they? Like in, in just about every business sector going around, everyone's talking about China, whether it's tourism or something else, and, and we're no different. And I think the first thing to say about China is that uh, last year we had China Southern start to fly direct from mainland China into Adelaide, and that is a game-changer in mm. inverted commas. Uh, we talk about these step changes, and that truly is one. And we've seen, you know, huge growth in visitation since that time. So they are a fascinating market. They're an undeniable market and they're getting stronger and stronger and we're seeing more and more growth here in South Australia. And part of the, the opportunity and the challenge is to actually make sure that we deliver experiences that they go home and rave about and they want to come back and do more. And, and we've certainly got a lot of those experiences. Now, there's the food and wine uh, uh, type of experience, but the nature experience that we're talking about today, is that, uh, uh, you know, pretty high up on their list? Absolutely. It I is. think if you, if you talk to Sandy about Cleland, mm. I mean, you know, which Chinese visitor wouldn't want to go to Cleland yeah. or some other attractions around the state here and hold a, um, a koala? Like, it's just it's, a, it's an experience to die for as far as the Chinese are concerned. Um, they're very adventurous. You know, they do really love nature-based tourism. Um, we sort of talk in Chinese ways, we talk about naturalness because it's a little bit more sort of city-centric in terms of the experiences they like because they're not like the Germans that will go, you know, 10 hours from a capital city mm. to, mm. you know, a, a two-person town and they love that experience. The Chinese love that experience but they like it to know that it's done in a little bit more of an urban setting around, if that makes sense. So... At places like Cleveland, and even just going for a walk on the beach at Glenelg mm. is, mm. A, you know, a nature-based tourism experience from their point of view. You know, that they don't get that opportunity, for most of them where they come from, so they really enjoy those experiences. And to have, like, a dolphin experience, you know, off Glenelg or a koala mm. experience in the hills or even the Botanic Gardens or things like that, they're highly desirable experiences for Chinese visitors. And, Sandy, uh, Cleveland uh, figures are going through the roof. They are, and we're we're getting a bit more adventurous ourselves, so there's a few more behind-the-scenes things you can do at Cleland. So if locals haven't been up there for a while, um, come up, because as Sean says, you've got the city views. You're really not very far away. You're in this beautiful, serene environment, and you can now um, go behind the scenes with a koala and see where the vets and our keepers actually keep them. We've still got the traditional koala holds, and there's a few other surprises around there as well. And some of the bird shows... Uh, 
you know, th- those educational uh, shows with the school kids and so forth, they're just fantastic, oh, aren't they? They are. And Absolutely I think wonderful. we sort of say we know people come for the koala and the koala hold, but often um, the report back is that the experience where a kangaroo came and ate something mm-hmm. out of someone's hand or the emu came up and sort of pecked their grandma is um, the thing that actually is the memory from then mm-hmm. on as well. Mm-hmm. So it's sometimes that surprise part that, that adds to it. Now, Craig Wickham, you run Exceptional Kangaroo Island and, as I said before, very appropriate name because Kangaroo Island is is the gem uh, on the Australian coastline. There's no doubt about that. It's got no... no there's nothing can, can top Kangaroo Island. It's got everything, isn't it? Yeah, look, I'm there by choice. I've been running the, the same business for uh, 27 years, so, you know, really love what I do and the, the team that we've got, uh, just really passionate about sharing the things that which we've got and I think the probably one of the most important things that we need to sort of get across in terms of this whole nature based strategy is that we are we're sharing things that we often take as South Australians we take for granted. But internationally and and increasingly interstate, uh, they're becoming less and less um, accessible. I'm talking about simple things like personal space, clean air, clean skies, clean water mm. and the ability just to get out and you know, away from busyness. You know, everyone's connected, you know, to their devices 24-7. You know, the ability just to step outside of that and just, you know, it's really, really empowering for people. And when you... I've just been in uh, in India for a week for a, a trade show and that the densities of people mm. and you, you're never on your own anywhere, you know, at any time of the day. Uh, and for some of our guests, they find the, the wide open space is a bit confronting. So we've got to be careful how we package that because otherwise they think it's an empty space and there's no one there and why they're not there. Mm. Um, I mean, I always tell people that, well, the population density for me on Kangaroo Island is one person per square kilometre. And they laugh and laugh yeah, because a lot of other places are, are hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of people per square kilometre. I'm talking across the board, not in the towns, but right across the board. So... I guess we are sharing the very best of of Kangaroo Island in terms of what, what my job is, and that is the amazing landscape, mm. the wildlife encounters, up close and personal at a respectful distance, but able to share that that sense of shared space where you're you're in the landscape, you're walking quietly and seeing an echidna just shuffling through the, the bushes or wallabies or roos, you know, the bird life or down on the beaches with the, the sea lions. Uh, people are amazed at the the diversity of those encounters, and also the diversity of uh, of landscapes. And I think from a you, you started out saying about what about the our interstate um, you know, visitors. So often you hear people who come to Adelaide and they can't believe how easy it is. Within a matter of five hours, you can be the southeast, the Riverland, yep. the Flinders, the Air, go down to Yorks. You know, there's, um, you know, there's, there's caves, there's sinkholes, there's, there's deserts. Yeah, you know, we've got such an extraordinary array of opportunity that if you look at a similar distance from any of our other major cities, they don't have anywhere near that diversity. And if they, the, the great places that, that you do have, they're always crowded because they've got, they bring so many more people because they're, they're much heavier urban sort of settlements than what we enjoy here in Adelaide. It's a great point. We're talking about nature-based tourism and the opportunities here in South Australia. If you've got an experience you want to share, give us a call, 8223 0000. South Australia. And it's great to be with you, nine minutes away from uh, two o'clock. Uh, and we're talking about nature-based tourism, uh, a wonderful uh, part of uh, the South Australian tourism scene um, and uh, one where I think um, you'd never run out of uh, things to see uh, because you might go and visit the, the, the Flinders, uh, you know, this year. Go back next year, you'll see something completely different. Uh, there's no doubt about that. We've got uh, our special guest with us, uh, the Chief Executive of the Department of Environment, Water and Natural Resources, Sandy Pitcher, is with us uh, also. So South Australian Tourism Industry Association General Manager Sean De Bruin and Tourism Operator Craig Wickham from uh, Kangaroo Island. Um, uh, Craig, we were just talking about uh, some of the great things about KI. One of the things that I think is is really valuable is you don't have to be, to get in, in touch with nature, you don't have to be, you know, the true four-wheel driver, the true, um, you know, hard uh, 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 cut um, bushwalker, you can literally get out of your car, wander into a into, into a, a little bit of bushland, and see that kangaroo, that wallaby, or that echidna. 
Yeah, it's uh, it's the thing I, I really love about the island is that you you don't have to go to a particular place to see a particular thing. Mm. You know, you just as long as you're aware of your, your surroundings. You know, often you have people. Um, you know, we'll be stopping on the side of the road, literally, and uh, you're know, looking at a little wallaby, you know, tucked away in the bush, and you know, all the self drivers zoom, zoom, zoom. They're off to the national park because that's where all the animals are. One of the great things about Kangaroo Island, and you know, you could say the same about the Mount Lofty Ranges nature's in pretty good nick mm. so mm. you know it's it's the yes we've got those beautiful parks which are sort of the the jewels but all the interconnecting uh, corridors of bush they provide the you know the, the you know ever important linkages so you know wherever you stop you're going to find you know evidence of you're not the only one in the landscape here there's a whole lot going mm. on mm. exactly yeah it, it, it really is and i mean as an example you can just pull off pull in for a cup of coffee at the uh, flinders chase national park at the cafe there wander out the back and do that 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 walking trail over to the um to the platypus pools yeah if you don't see half a dozen animals on the way and it's only what a couple of kilometers flat yep. ground i don't have to be a bushwalker to do it no it's Even just a kids wonderful can do it yeah, yeah it's just <laughs> wonderful whether you see a platypus at the end of it or not doesn't matter um um, it's, it is just a wonderful experience. Sandy, um, one of the things that um, uh, is obviously uh, an area that uh, we can probably explore more is the Indigenous uh, relationship uh, with this great country of ours. And we're talking about the River Murray, we're talking about the Flinders, we're talking about KI, the, the, the hills, uh, the Eyre Peninsula. Um, is that an area where we're going to explore a bit more? Absolutely, and, and my department particularly is spending has been spending over many years building up co-management of our park. So I'm not even sure that many South Australians realise, but um, in about 25 parks across South Australia, they're actually co-managed by the local Aboriginal traditional owners and the Department of Environment, and th- those co-management boards sit in the place of the decision maker like the Director of National Parks would otherwise do. So we're on a really great journey there because th- that co-management gives the traditional owners a chance to build their own businesses, mm. their own cultural importance of that landscape. It means they're involved in the decisions of signage, of paths, protecting the most important areas. But I think for the visitors making a visitor experience that actually really is respectful of the traditional owners and is able to tap into their knowledge of the land. I think it's a really exciting thing and it's something that South Australia is leading the nation on. And it's and it's uh, having been there, done that many, many times, it just makes you appreciate what you're looking at a ha- whole lot more, doesn't it? Having that other story. That's right. It just yeah. opens your eyes in a completely different way. Mm. And the sto- I also find for talking about getting kids into, mm. you know, off their screens and into tourism, hearing the story from the Aboriginal owners that that actually is usually a dreaming story is just such a great way to open kids' hearts and minds. And even our newest um, nature play play space at Morialta that I think hopefully many um, locals are getting to know about, so many of that parts of that playground and that play space are actually designed around the local stories of the Ghana. And again, having the snake and having all these other things is actually connecting people to nature in all of the different ways. Mm. Sean, just finally, um, what do you as f- f- from the uh, from the industry point of view, where do you think we should be heading? What do we need to do, you know, sooner rather than later? Um, well, there's always lots to be done, Alan. Um, and I guess from an industry point of view, we're always you know keen to see investment um, in the in the tourism industry. Um, and I think Craig highlighted earlier that the you know Sandy's department has a fantastic plan. It's called Nature Like Nowhere Else. It's a really good plan about how we can grow the opportunity of nature-based tourism, and how we can make sure that it helps sustain local communities, um, provide support um, for environment and conservation work, um, and ultimately drives jobs in particularly in regional areas it's such an important part of the job equation for us as a state so mm. we're very very lucky in south australia we as as craig again said you know nature's in pretty good nick you know there's so many special places around this amazing state of ours um and um and people from all over the world want to come and visit learn about um what they're seeing and interact with with these special places and there's so many good opportunities to create jobs and sustainable local communities it is and i mean we started out talking about this the variety around the state uh, sandy um we d- it really does make us stand out from the rest of the states so you think about my home state of Victoria, mm. there's, um, you know, there, there's, the, there's the hills country, there's Gippsland, there's the Twelve Apostles, you know, the Great Ocean Road, then there's the, uh, the high country. 
Not much else. Yeah. Look at us. Oh, yeah. Hey, we've got the West Coast, the far West Coast. We've got the Riverland. We've got the Murray Land. We've got the South East, you know, the Limestone Coast. We've got Flinders. We've got uh, the Adelaide Hills and we've got KI. That's right. And it is really easy to get to so many of those places mm. from Adelaide. And I think that's what the Chinese tourists are starting to see and that's what other people are starting to see, that, that you can do so much nature and you can get to KI and everywhere else from a base of a city that also has nature as a very important part. Adelaide is a really green city and we've got our parklands and our beaches. So it is a great combination. I think our capital city is the gateway door does actually tell the story that we're a, a community that can cares about our environment and cares about connecting to that environment too. And just finally, um, the, 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 there is you know a school of thought that the more we actually publicise this and get more visitors, the more damage we do. And that's that's an argument I often hear about Kangaroo Island. You know, we'll destroy Kangaroo Island if we put too many people over there. What do you think? It's a pretty big space. You, know, you look at from one end to the other as uh, Gawler to uh, um, Cape Jervis mm. and... There's so few people in the landscape at the moment. The effective uh, population's 4,500. If you look at the number of visitors and look at the length of stay, it effectively doubles our population. So we've got the the impact, whatever that is, of, of less than 10,000 people over mm. that entire space. We have to be mindful of, um, of impacts, and impacts are not general. They're specific things at particular places which you can take, you know, care of and I think we're in a wonderful position where there's many many places around the world that have already been there and they've they've found creative ways to address crowding and you know all the site hardening all the all the infrastructure stuff you need and we can do it really creatively so we are you know putting nature first and then making sure that people are able to interact with it in a respectful manner. Mm. Mm. And Sandy, your department would be uh, keeping a very close watch on that, I would assume. Oh, absolutely. And I think, as Craig says, we're lucky to be able to grab the science and information from around the world to make sure that we put sustainable tourism at the fore. And for me, the more people who get to understand our environment, the better chance we all will have to protect it because people will understand what an impact is. And it isn't just existing in the environment, it's how you operate within it. And there's such easy lessons that, you know, we're teaching kids of today mm. about mm. that and we can all learn more about that. Fantastic. Well, listen, all the best with it. Uh, it's uh, As I say, it's it's a wonderful opportunity for all of us and uh, create jobs and uh, and share this wonderful state in which we live. Uh, Sandy Pitcher from uh, the uh, Department of Environment, Water and Natural Resources. Uh, also, uh, Sean DeBrun and Craig Wickham. Great to have you in and uh, we'll see you out on the road sometime. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.